This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and it's camera review time. This time we're going to look at a Canon camera that came out just a couple of months ago, but it's really hitting the big box stores now, and it's the smallest one here. This is for those of you who are looking for something compact size, point and shoot size, but with more capabilities. This competes with the Sony RX100, RX100 Model 3 particularly, but it brings a couple of neat features to the table, like a rear touchscreen. You can use it for focusing and for just operating the camera in general. And it has a longer zoom lens, just as fast as the latest Sony camera, but longer zoom. We're going to look at it now. So this is the PowerShot G7X. Now, Canon has a history with their PowerShot G series cameras being a little higher end. You got the metal body, you got more manual features on there, and they're smallifying it, much smaller than even the G1X or G1X Mark II more modern sensor as well. What does it use for a sensor inside? That's what's really interesting and exciting here. It uses the same 20 megapixel, one inch Sony sensor as the RX100 Mark II and Mark III. So you've got a backside illuminated sensor, one of the best on the market if you're looking at one inch sensors. Pretty neat. And look at the size difference here. We have the very capable and enthusiast oriented Panasonic Lumix LX100, which is a pretty darn compact camera, and it looks kind of, well, big next to our friend right here now, right? And here's a, one of the most compact full-frame digital SLRs. It's a Canon EOS 6D, to give you an idea. And we'll show you what it looks like next to the Sony A6000, because a lot of you are thinking about maybe an interchangeable lens camera as well. And you can see the big difference isn't so much, well, the body on the A6000 and the photo we're going to splice in, but the lenses. Once you start putting especially faster lenses on it that approximate the very fast lens on the Canon, you're talking about another big thing to carry around. So for those of you who want to travel small, this is for you. So here it is. It fits in the palm of my hand very easily. And I have just about man-sized hands, very long fingers. So that, that gets into the challenge with these ultra-compact cameras is if you've got pretty large-sized hands, you might actually find it a little difficult to operate. The texture is less slippery than the Sony RX100 series there. It's got a little bit, you can see the, the texture to it. It's made of metal, feels more solid too. It's, it's a little bit of a chunk of metal, 10.7 ounces, but there's no real grip here per se. There's a place to put your fingers, but there's no grip point. Looking right at the front right here, the star of the show, or one of the stars of the show, has got to be this lens. One of the drawbacks for the RX103 is the zoom lens got short and it got faster, matches the f1.8 to 2.8 at the tel telephoto, and it's going to get a little bit slower, that lens, but it keeps the 24 to 100 millimeter zoom range. So for those of you who are portrait types or want to get a little bit more isolation from your background when shooting portraits or something like that, great for portraits just at having it 90 millimeter to 100 millimeter, and you get that better background separation, can make a real difference. It can be a deal breaker if that's the kind of thing that you shoot. Obviously, it has the usual kind of pedal lens cover right here, automatically opens up when you turn the camera on, no lens cap to lose. Uh, looks pretty effective to me. I'm not too worried about a lot of schmutz getting on that lens. It is a pocketable camera, however, and that's the funny thing about these teeny little pocket cameras. They're attractive because you say, hey, well, I can put it in the, my pocket. But then some of us are pretty much gear nerds and we worry about what else is in our pockets with the camera and all the lint and dust bunnies and stuff like that. That's up to you, of course. You can always put it in a little case and it's still pretty pocketable. Because it's small, they figure you're going to use a hand strap. So we have a hand strap attachment over here. No dual lugs for a hanging on your neck kind of arrangement. It would look kind of silly, honestly, if you did that. Flash pops up right there with the lever, and that is the flash up here. It's a built-in flash. Let's turn it on so we can deploy that flash. Now, you, you can't actually tilt this guy back. That's, that's the only bad thing. If you want to do a bounce flash, it is either up or it is down. There is no bouncing. Bummer. On the side here, we have the little Wi-Fi symbol. This does have Wi-Fi with NFC to help pairing with your phone. It works with iOS and Android phones. It's a little bit tedious to get it set up, and it's a pretty basic application. It, you can transfer your photos and your videos to your smartphone, but for in terms of having a lot of control using remote control on the phone, not so much. Really, Sony and Panasonic are, are kind of kicking booty there when it comes to doing that. Push the flash down. You know, it feels more solid compared to the Sony RX100 that feels very, very delicate. That's one thing about that. And voila, we have a 
touch screen back here so you can do touch to focus. Nothing to focus on right now, but really handy feature for all those times when the camera really doesn't get exactly what point you want to have in focus. Also useful in terms of depth of field because you've got something that has a pretty wide lens so you can make sure that you've got your bokeh where you want it and you've got your sharpness where you want it. It's a very solid single hinge mount point right there. It's not the two-way scissor though. So you can go up all the way to selfie mode like so right there. See, but you can't tilt it the other way. So if you want to hold it over your head at a concert and tilt the screen down, you, you cannot do that. Still, the fact that it is touch screen and it's a very nice, the usual one million dot viewfinder screen. It's pretty visible outdoors. It's not bad. One thing it doesn't have is an electronic viewfinder, any kind of viewfinder whatsoever other than your three inch LCD right here. So if the light is really bright or if you're just used to framing your shots by putting your eye to the viewfinder, you can't do it here. A little concession to make it a little easier to hold. We've got this little sculpted thumb piece right here. So you've got something to hold on to when you're shooting. Pretty much standard controls right here. We've got our four-way control. We've got function set. We've got menu. We've got video playback. You can change the ring function around the lens, which is nice. You can go with the default, or you can switch it to a variety of useful things. Switch to manual focus just by touching over there. Manual focus on this is, however, kind of a torture. You can either assign the dial on the ring to do it, but listen to this. It's a very stiff, ratchety click. Now, we might complain about Sony for having absolutely no clicks because they're making it very friendly for video as well, but this is the stiffest, clickiest thing in the world. It's not bad when you're doing stepped zoom, and it can make some sense there. And when you're doing your aperture, boy, you really know that you're, you're switching to a different aperture, but it's not much fun. So you can also use the up-down buttons here if you want to do manual focus. Uh, neither way am I too thrilled. So it's a good thing it has 31-point autofocus to use contrast detection. I find it pretty quick. Now some people have said, well, it's kind of slow. I'm, I have not had any problem with that. I have not had the yellow box of doom that says it can't focus unless I'm trying to focus a macro shot too close. When you're in telephoto mode with this guy, which is where I like to take a lot of macro shots, unfortunately for the back background separation, many people do, you really can't get terribly close when you're focusing. I mean, you have to be about a foot and a half away for it to reliably work. This side right here, we have our AV connections. We have micro HDMI out, and that is just for playback to your TV. It doesn't do any live feed out to a monitor where you're recording. There is no microphone jack. There is no headphone jack. We're still talking compact camera, not something more professional there. And we have the usual micro USB connection so you can hook it up to your camera for data transfer, software upgrades, that sort of thing. On the bottom, we have our metal tripod mount. Notice it's pretty close to the door for the battery card and the SD card slot. That will probably annoy some of you who use a tripod. Honestly, with cameras this small, that gets to be a very difficult proposition where you're going to fit all those things. So SD card right there. Battery here. Not a very big battery. You can, of course, buy spares, and happily, it comes with a charger in the box. You don't just get a USB cable to USB charge it, which, generally speaking, is a lot slower than using this charger here. This way, if you have multiple batteries, it's easy to charge up a spare while you have one on the camera. I much prefer this than having to go out and buy it separately, like Sony makes you do lately. Anyway, compact cameras, whether it's the RX100 Mark III or this guy right here, battery life is not super duper. Now, the official ratings are pretty demanding for these things, including using the flash for every other shot and all sorts of things people may not do. Realistically speaking, I find that I get about 400 shots from this. And that's using flash at most 25% of the time. Because honestly, that, fa that backside illuminated sensor and the fast lens just mean I really don't need the flash that often. Up top, you'll see a nice selection of controls. There's our on-off button. This is our take a shot button. And this is the zoom function right here. Again, you can assign the ring on the lens to handle zoom if that feels more natural to you. I know I'm more used to that as a camera traditionalist. And you've got your usual PASM modes up here. You've got Canon's auto mode. You can shoot in JPEG and you can shoot in RAW. Here's the one got you though. If you, if you like Canon's auto mode, it only shoots in JPEG in auto mode. Hmm. So you got to put in program mode if you want to shoot RAW plus JPEG or just RAW. I Nah, that kind of irks me a little bit. You can shoot video if you want just in auto mode right here or you can actually go to the dedicated 
video selection. It shoots the usual 1080p at 60 frames per second using the AVC HD codec. It's a pretty good bit rate there. It's 33 megabit per second. Still not as good as the Sony for those of you who are really into higher format. It has a 50 megabit per second XAVC-S codec on the Sony. But you know what? If you're talking about something that is a, a point-and-shoot travel camera without any audio inputs or anything like that, how important that is that? Honest to goodness, you know, it's... Well, it's up to you. One other thing we have right here is EV compensation right on a dial, plus three, minus three, and one-third increments. The bad news is, is this is also really very stiff, so you want to use this one-handed and, you know... I have a pretty good grip there. It's kind of hard to do. Anyway, let's take a look at focusing speeds. And this isn't the world's easiest thing. We got a little black box on white right there. Focus speeds are pretty good. I'm shooting RAW plus JPEG right now. The file save times are a little bit slow there, I would say, compared to just shooting in JPEG. So say I throw my hand in and pretty close. It's going to want to pick up on my hand. Hello, hand. So that can be kind of tricky. So that's when you want to use something like tap to focus. Uh -huh. If you can juggle all this around without a hand grip. There we go. So you get the idea. Performance is not that bad. Navigating the menus, we have the usual two separate set here. We have the basic menu settings that are right here. You can also use touch to do that. Face detection, touch to autofocus, touch to shoot, things like that. All normal. And then you have your quick function settings here. Now, since we are in automatic, there's not too many options here. You have all the usual aspect ratios. You've got 3 by 2, 4 by 3, 1 to 1, 16 by 9. Resolution that you're choosing, resolution for your photos, timer, things like that. So, pretty easy stuff there. Now, how about if you're taking a video and you want to use the touch screen to pull focus from one item to another? So now I've focused on that, and what if I want to pull focus over to here? And there you go. So this is a dream for shooting video. I have to say, it's much easier than using little dial buttons or anything else. Wherever you want to move focus to, you've got it. You can do it with this. So there's actually some pretty darn cool features on the camera that I like, particularly. And you can see from the sample images that we're going to show you in just a minute, you can actually get some good depth of field, some fairly thin depth of field by a camera of this size standards. You know, I mean, this is a teeny camera, but you're still talking a fairly fast lens. And then you get into the argument, okay, it's, it's f1.8 at the wide end. It keeps the aperture fairly open till about 50 millimeters, more open than it does on the Sony RX103. f2.8 is still f1.8. Granted, you have a smaller sensor, it doesn't gather as much light, but when it comes to things like being able to set the bokeh on, on all that sort of thing, it's still f1.8 is f1.8 the way it works. So you can get some background separation there. Not like you're going to get on a full frame sensor or even something like the APS-C sensor on the Sony A6000, but enough to get a little bit more sophisticated looking shots. Something that doesn't look like you took it with your old point and shoot camera, that sort of thing. The reach on the lens is really nice and fantastic. I mean, you've got digital zoom here, but who wants to use it? But being able to go out to 100 millimeters Pretty sweet on this. The touch screen with autofocus, also really very nice on this. So those are the things that I like about the camera. I also like that it's built like a little baby tank. It's really, really nice. The clicky wheel, I actually like when I'm doing something, setting aperture priority or shutter speed. Not so much for, for zooming, step zooming even, yeah, and for manual focus, not my favorite thing right there. Hey buddy, how come you're being so still? You're never so still. Let's see how the stabilization works. So I have to say it has some things going for it 
compared to the RX 103. Now the RX 102, you've got the same zoom length there, but you've got much slower at the telephoto end. Really hard to get much any depth of field effects than depth of field on the RX 102. I know I've shot with it, I've used it, I like it, but that is what it is. Things you don't get here that may be important, important to you though, no electronic viewfinder, and obviously no hot shoot, which the RX 102 had, not the RX 103. And we'll be looking at that Panasonic Lumix LX100 too, which adds a whole lot of those features, but it makes the camera a little bit bigger. So who is this for? Those of you who really want a camera that can function in manual mode if you need, but have the feel of a point and shoot and the, and the portability of that. If you're looking for more photographer's features, you're an advanced photographer, probably something like the Lumix LX100 is going to be for you, or the Fuji X100, for example. But for the point and shoot crowd, now you know what the difference is between this and the Sony RX100 Mark III and some of the really good features it offers. So that's the Canon PowerShot G7X. It's available now. And again, if you're looking for something really small in that RX100 Mark I, II, or three category, or as small as some of the other point and shoots on the market, but you want manual capabilities, you want 1080p video recording, you want a really fast lens that actually gets you some bokeh, you know, it's actually really worth a look. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit mobiletechreview.com for our full written review and subscribe to our YouTube channel.